I've never heard anything Thank like it. All right. Will the regular meeting of the Atherton Rail Committee please come to order? Uh, Robert, would you call a roll? Uh, Malcolm Dudley? Here. Uh, Jack Ringham? Here. Greg Conlon? Here. Paul Jones? Here. Scott Lane? Here. Nerissa Dexter? Here. Jim Jans? Not here. Not here. Alex K via teleconference? Here. Anthony Wynn? Here. Here. Uh, John Maldon? Here. Okay. Hey, and then we have uh, Councilmember Wiest? Here. Liaison. We have a quorum. We can proceed. Uh, do we have public comments that you'd like before we start? Yes, please. This is Friday's on agenda, correct? Correct. I have a procedural question that the public comment on the agenda is slated for the absolute end of the item where many of us are here to address item 5E. And I would like to suggest that the public comment regarding 5E be placed prior to the opening of that item for participating therein as we go along. I think we can move. Right at the end, after everything's been recommended, decided, talked about, the citizens get to have input. We, 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 will, we will move that forward in the agenda, and I suggest we have that. Uh, let's take that first, right, right after the uh, approval of the minutes. Um, I think that's probably the longest time. I think we'll do is, uh, if, correct me if I'm wrong, is this as we start sorry, that? I'm sorry, I didn't remember. If, if I heard you correctly, it's just as we hit that item to take public comment in the beginning and during the conversation. Before anything yeah, is decided, yeah. Sure. yeah. So you don't need to move it up because the other stuff's going to go okay. pretty quick. Okay. Well, that's fine. All right. Well, we can we can have public comment starting right now. Public comment when I no, I, I think that as we hit five E, he just wants to have that in the beginning oh. of, of the actual item. Okay. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion? Yeah. Five E to the instead of five E. Yeah. yeah. Move it up. Yeah, one that way you that, okay. That's what I was suggesting. Okay. We move it up after the uh, approval of the minutes. Okay. Thank you, Karen. Are there other initial public comments that you'd like to make? We got any extra copies? This is a Okay. Uh, you all received the minutes for our December 1st, 4th meeting. Are there any additions or corrections? Um, yeah, I think uh, Jim was the one who suggested the Hamilton report article, not me. So just a minor correction there. Okay, we will correct that. Thank you. Other corrections or additions? We have a, a motion to approve the minutes. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right. The minute, the minute Alex, so you're opposed? No, I, I, I. He's, okay. he's slow to respond. <laughs> it's all right. We'll get along with that. Yeah. Okay. So now we will move into the regular agenda, and we will start now with uh, a 5E discussion and recommendations regarding future train service in Atherton. Town rail policy and state legislation regarding housing along transportation corridors. And I would like to begin that by uh, asking for public comment so we can get your views in hand before we start our discussion. Okay, I'll start. Um, I just stand or? Well, st stand or sit. Fair enough. So um, so my, my name is Matt. I live on Fair Oaks. I live about 500 feet from the train. Um, we've been a resident here for about almost three years now. Um, I'm a Pinnacle native, born in San Mateo. Um, I'm still in my 30s, so a lot of my perspectives are very forward-looking. Um, we're hoping to be a, my, our growing family is hoping to be a part of the community for a very long time, maybe 40, 50 years, hopefully, depending on how things go. Uh, you know, so that was just kind of characterizing my perspective. We were drawn to Atherton for its bucolic environment, you know, the trees, the quiet streets as well as I mean, has the advantage of being close to all the, all the other amenities of being in a close location in the peninsula. Um, you know, I've actually, it's my understanding that the, the fate of the station is, is, a, is, a big is a big topic conversation, a big thing to talk about this committee. And 
you know, I've actually uh, attended the last rail committee and spoke a little bit there. Um, I've actually watched believe it or not, all the rail committee episodes on, on YouTube as well. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> um, a lot of times I'm admittedly doing other things at the same time, but I am watching them. <laughs> um, and so I've thought about the issues and I've talked with other you know, members of the community who are south of Fair Oaks, particularly when I spoke to some of those, and um, so I'm here on behalf of some of those who can't be here um, as well. Um, you know, and having talked to them, they've thought about some of the, the advantages and disadvantages. Um, we're kind of coming out with our opinion is that I um, strongly believe that we should consider closing the station. Um, you know, consider closing, what? Closing the, closing the station, the Atherton station, just the Atherton station. Um, you know, there are a couple of benefits that come with that, that I want to talk a little bit about. Um, closing the station allows us to immediately extend the quiet zone through the station area, allowing for a continuous quiet zone ultimately if we ever get quad gates at Watkins. Um, as I understand it, as long as there's a station there, Atherton still has a regulation that, that they can blow as they ask. That, those are federal regulations. They, federal federal regulations. Has no control over they, they, Thank you for the clarification. Yet again, once again, how we're in a bind with the station being there with respect to the forms. Yes. Um, and so that benefit provides an immediate benefit to those who are south of south of Pharaoh's Lane. Um, you know, it, it's 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 been uh, mentioned several times that the quiet zone has really dramatically improved the lives of those who are in Wilmington Park. And I guess I asked for those residents who were there to think about their fellow after the residents who are south of Ferris and we don't still enjoy that. As you know, sitting through these meetings, you know, and in the library, the train comes barreling through and blasts the horn. And that's something that, you know, we would also like to see if, if those could be stopped. This also has benefits because we're also building a town center right next to where the station is. You know, as my understanding is, the town center is the biggest infrastructure project in the history of this town. Um, tens of short history. Short history, <laughs> short history. Still history. Um, you know, we're going to have an outdoor community court in the library that lie only a few hundred feet from the tracks. Um, and so the patrons of that, of that brand new facility would also benefit from, from reducing the noise. Um, and, you know, on, on a personal note, for those of us who actually do watch the committee meetings on YouTube, it would be nice because the mic picks up a lot of the train horn noise if you ever watch. It actually drowns out the voices and can make it. I have to go back and put on my headphones to repeat to hear certain things that the horn does. So it does have a, a, an effect in other ways as well, and like the few members to consider. Um, what else? I mean, uh, closing the station also provides opportunities to integrate the station and the surrounding land into the town center that's being built. Um, you know, if we were to get an easement, it provides opportunities for sound as well as for safety improvements that also benefit those who are patronizing, you know, uh, the town center. We can actually have green space to grow trees, to um, improve you know, the landscape as well. And the station structure could also be potentially maintained by the town. We could potentially take ownership of that and, and convert it to a historical monument, you know, mentioning and citing some of the contributions that the town of Atherton and the members of this rail committee have had towards Peninsula Rail and the development of rail throughout, uh, throughout its history. So I thought that would be an opportunity for us to take control of that and actually commemorate it in the way it should be, um, rather than always asking that trade for money to, 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 to improve it. Um, closing the station also reduces both the gate bell noise and the, the, the gate down time. And when you have trains on the northbound, you're going to have the gates down at Fair Oaks, something that's going to be increased as long as you have electrification, more trains going through. The southbound, they have to be closed when, when walking gates have to be closed and those bells have to be run too. So, it, it, there, so closing the station also avoids that. Um, finally, another thing I want to talk about, this is something that I think touched on a little bit the last rail committee is that um, closing the station allows Atherton in a lot of ways to be a responsible member of the Peninsula Rail community. Um, it, is, it, it improves the efficiency of Caltrain to get the most riders up and down that corridor. It's my understanding that you know, if, if the, the choice of opening a stop at Atherton is a choice for Caltrain to take stops away from more heavily trafficked locations such as Redwood City or, or Menlo Park. Um, and that, would, and that in, in the grand scheme of things, we think potentially may, may not be great for the peninsula as a whole. Um, tied to this is the fact that opening the station to weekly stops is likely a short-term benefit. Um, as Caltrain faces greater and greater pa passenger pressure from those two neighboring communities, they're, they're gonna feel pressure to take back those stops back, back to Redwood City and Menlo Park. And these are things that are, things that are new. And um, I'd like to point out, you know, everybody who's driven down Redwood City, all those new developments on Jefferson's, we're talking about hundreds of units coming online. You have downtown Redwood City, Sequoia Station is, you know, 
relatively new as well. Menlo Park also has a downtown plan that calls for higher density residential housing. You already have Station 1300 with, with the Greenheart developer that's put in there. You have the Middle Avenue project from Stanford that also has housing, all of which are, are, are going to be putting pressure on, on the Menlo Park stations and asking, and, and writers there are gonna wonder why, why are they still stopping that? Why are they not stopping at Menlo Park? Um, th those pressures, while there may be historical precedent, this, uh, it's, it's my understanding that these, these pressures are recent and unprecedented and it will force Caltrain to make choices. And so whatever benefit we derive from having a station local zone is probably going to be short lived. Um, well, let, let's try and wrap that up. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap that up very, very, very quickly. Um, finally, there's also been talk about closing the station, eliminating train access for, for Atherton residents. Um, and I, I just want to clarify that the Menlo Park station is only 1.5 miles from, at, from at the Atherton station. There are actually a lot of residents um, in Menlo Park and Palo Alto commute longer distance to their own train station. Just to keep her perspective. And the, at the Menlo Park station is actually closer to many residents, pretty frankly, all of Lindenwood. I Google mapped it. It's actually closer to the Menlo Park station than the Atherton station. Large swaths of West, of West Atherton and West of the Alameda are also closer to the Menlo Park station. So when people say, um, I just want to clarify that closing the Atherton station does not mean Atherton residents don't have access to, 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 the, to a train stop. That is, that is patently false. Um, and, that, and we have to consider that when we don't live in a vacuum. We have a close in location next to many other things. We enjoy the amenities of, of going to the grocery store, going shopping, of being in that close of a location. We should also not exclude rail access from that consideration as well. Um, I guess uh, I, I have to wrap it up. I just want a couple things. Just um, think about your fellow residents, those of us who are south of Fair Oaks, we don't have a quiet zone yet. And even if you put Watkins in there, we'll never have a quiet zone as long as the station is there. Um, think with some vision a little bit. Think about what you can do with that space and how it can be integrated into our town center. Um, we are not in a vacuum. Uh, just think about how we are in terms of the greater peninsula community. Um, and also remember, close, and that's why closing the, the, trains, the train station does not foreclose train access for afternoon residents. And also think about the future. Um, I know that people on this committee have been embroiled in conversations with Caltrain for many years, dedicated, you know, frankly, decades of their lives from what I can tell, talking about the history of the Peninsula Rail. We appreciate that. I'm new to the community, and I, I can hear that. But at the end of the day, I guess I'm asking that, once again, as a public service, think about the future. Think about going forward what we're doing as a community. Think about the community and the greater peninsula in the future. Okay. Thank you. Are there other public comments that are uh, different information than we've already heard? I can ask, if I may. Yes, please, go ahead. Because, um, boy, there were, you covered everything. <laughs> but, um, go ahead. Is it okay that you want me to stand or just go up? Um, evening, mayors all and everyone else in the room. Um, my name is Christine David, and my husband and I have been residents of the town of Atherton for over 20 years. We raised our two adult kids not really, in the town, and uh, have enjoyed the train from when they were little ones. So we have a great sentimental value towards the, the, sh the structure that we love and we call the station, but I think it's not the station itself, it's the, the structure next door. We love it too. Um, <clears throat> I, just as a form of background, I was um, an active member of the CCAC, that was a wonderful experience, and I'm a current member of the Holder Power Park and Rec Committee. Um, and I live right up the street on Ashfield Road, so this all very much pertains to me and my family and, and our neighborhood. Um, I think the biggest thing that I can add in terms of concerns, because the rest of it is shot, thank you, um, <laughs> is that, first of all, security. I have personal um, experience with security. I grew up in San Francisco, fifth generation San Franciscan, you know, a, a prominent family in the city uh, with a father with a big mouth who told everyone. The result of that was that my sister and I were kidnapped from our homes, and we were, they gained access to our home from the public transportation three blocks away from our house, sadly. So I come at this from that perspective of asking to consider safety as an issue with the increase in our crime in the town and surrounding towns. If we were to close the train station, then perhaps those that aren't meant to be here have a hard time getting here and leaving from here, so just a thought. Um, the other idea is that uh, I, um, many, many people called today to talk to me because I live here and I'm, I'm involved, and their biggest concern really was that uh, SB 50 might pass. 
and uh, they were voicing that concern from a realistic perspective because San Francisco is very uh, liberal and very uh, right, you know, leading towards the democratic side of things. And um, they have a problem right now. They have people all over the streets. It's my town. It's awful to go up there. They have you know high density needs. They have um, needs for the people that are there with no income or very little income, and there's nowhere to put them. So uh, if you look through SB 50, which thankfully it's been recommended over and over again, the net result seems to be that the high income, lowest density, smaller towns like ours and similar are the target. And um, Alex asked me to mention that if we're not on the menu, then we better be eating. So meaning we're on the menu right now, let's step away and be the ones progressively acting against this SB 50. And, in that mind, keeping, keeping in mind the closure of the train station here, but preserving, I think. I, I love the idea of preserving it, it as a historic site. I think we all love that. So that's all I can add. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments that would add? Yes, please. Yeah, my name is Jim Massey. I lived in Atherton for almost 60 years. I moved here as a teenager. I have served on the Park and Rec Commission. I've had great community involvement. I've been on Park and Rec for probably 12 years, was chair twice. I've had the Culver Park, Park Foundation. I've served on the Audit Committee and the Finance Committee for an additional 12 years. So the first rail committee meeting I went to was I would call nostalgia and history lesson from Mr. Dudley and Mr. Janice. So I would like to provide some history also from my perspective. I had the opportunity to wash police cars and count cars on Marsh Road for Chief Hubbard for perceived teenage violation. I also rode the train to the city. My father commuted to the city. He lived in Lindenwood. I had a summer job in San Francisco and I took the train. I was even able to hustle guys to buy me a drink at Ricky's Bar, which was at the end of the train. Malcolm, you probably remember that. Many of you don't even know have the idea. <laughs> so, I have experience as to Mr. Jans's comment that he bought a house in this area and took the train in consideration, I can say the same thing. I live in the Lloyd and Park neighborhood. Mr. Jans lives on the track. I live on El Camino Real. When I came in El Camino Real, my wife and I bought the house. We would come out of Lloyd and Drive. It was a two-lane road. You could turn left to go to Meadow Park and Palo Alto you could go to the right. There was actually a Chevron gas station on the corner of Almondraw and El Camino, as well as a real estate office right across the street on El Camino. The only two commercial establishments the only two. in the You're town correct. of Atherton. You've probably been in the town as long as I have, so I was disappointed at the rail meeting. I didn't get to play history with the boys, but that's you know, <laughs> so a little bit of right now. So my, what I've got to say is, Nostalgia is lovely. We all can remember where we lived, what happened to kid, the lover we didn't have, whatever. But history is history. Nostalgia is nostalgia. You cannot go home again, guys. This train station has been closed for 14 years. Electrification is coming down the tracks whether we like it or not. Just like El Camino, which had no flooding when I lived and moved here, and now has flooding because Caltrans did it. I couldn't stop that. I didn't get any exception. My backyard turns into swimming pool. And I have asked the council to come in sometime this summer, bring their suits. I'll even serve drinks for them to come and see the flooding in my backyard and Mr. Tonelli's backyard. So I'm saying it's been 14 years. The station has been closed. The trains are coming. If we open it, we are going to seriously impact the speed of the trains we need to be focused on these two grade separation. What's it going to do to the traffic through this town with the trains coming every three minutes? We're going to, and we're saying we're going to delay it more, and we need to then rebuild the station. I agree with this gentleman. We should be focused on that. We should be focused on we're building a brand new civic center. We can incorporate that old beautiful train station, which again, as a kid, I rode to the city and back from the city incorporate into the new civic center and make something really nice for this town and get rid of the horns, which is the second issue. I'm, I'm deaf anyway, so I, you know, even enough on the road and I can't hear it most of the time. But, so that's all I've got to say. I, 
strongly oppose any recommendation to the council or to Caltrain to reopen this station. Close it. Close it now. History's history. Nostalgia is lovely. Close it. Thank you. And thank you for letting people speak early. I really appreciate it. Are there other? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to say from my wife and I standpoint, uh, we completely support the uh, gentleman over there's point of view. And but you did so nicely in the last couple of Thank you very much. And he was trying to take and it. By the way, I know, uh, <laughs> we live in Boyden Park. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Yes. Sorry. All right. I'm Randy Hobbit. I have been uh, Boyden Park for 22 years, and I agree with everything that Matt said and Jim. Uh, there's really no practical way that the train station can be opened again, given that uh, Caltrain is wanting to boost the frequency of train service up and down the peninsula. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Yes? Hi, Elise Barca. I live in Lincoln Park and have for a long time. Um, I have fond memories of the train. I think all of us do. I remember my son getting on the train to go south to Bellingham. I remember my daughter getting on the train to go north to St. Ignatius in San Francisco. And that was a good time. But at this point, I think that the train station as such has truly outlived its purpose as progress continues. I love the idea of making, moving it, and making it some sort of centerpiece in the new town. Center. I think that's a lovely idea. Um, and I can't imagine anyone not supporting that. Thank you. Thank you. Now that we have we've heard the, the public comments using that as a backdrop, I'd like to get into the charge that we had from the council at our joint meeting on January 9th. They have asked us to put together a rail of policy for the town and submit it to them for review at their meeting the end of this month. I'd like to do that. I think we're a, a proper body for doing it because the 10 committee members are all relatively close to the station. We represent the area that is best served by the station. Malcolm, I think you live furthest away in uh, Lindenwood. The rest of us are all a little closer, some very close, and we, we have no representation on the committee from uh, Deep West Atherton. So uh, we understand the problem. We live with it on a day-to-day -day basis, just as you do. And I would, I would like to go through this in a, a very systematic order and see if we can build from the ground up a, a possible consensus solution. And I'd like to begin by agreeing or listing the impacts that we need to consider uh, that are uh, attributable to the station. Uh, we, we have noise, which everyone has brought up. Brought up. The uh, security issue was raised. Uh, the parking problem was not discussed, but it exists because we're losing a good deal of our parking space to the electrification and for the station parking space to the electrification and, that will not, and to the town center. And that will not come back. That will be a problem. Uh, we have access problems. The station is accessible on Fair Oaks, uh, on, on uh, Watkins, and through Lloyden Park, and that's it. There are no other direct accesses into the station. So we need to consider that. And then the final thing is the uh, SB50 Gorilla uh, High Density Parking, what impact that we might have on that. And high density housing. housing. High density housing. What did I say? High density parking. parking. You've got to keep an eye on that. Those things slip in. It probably goes together. <laughs> uh, do, are there other... Uh, criteria that we should list that uh, the station impacts that we should have in our evaluation process. I have, I have a uh, would you like me yes. to would you like me to read? Yes I would. Okay. Thank you, Paul. I've prepared a brief statement because I am concerned about two major issues. So uh, bear with me a second and I will read this. 
Caltrain has committed. I'll wait till this passes. Okay. You want to move up closer to the microphone so people know you have one down there. And it's right here. Right here. Why don't you move up here so people in the audience can hear you? Can you hear me all? No, I'll, I'll, I'm talking about on the video. Oh. Jack, Jack, can you pull that one? Jack, Jack, can you pull that microphone down a little bit? Doesn't have much. Long enough? Uh, no, that's the end of the string. Okay. Oh, so, just Marissa, come up and sit next to Jack while you do that. All right, very good. Caltrain has committed to increase its passenger capacity. To do so, Caltrain has said it must run more trains by decreasing the spacing between trains while not exceeding its maximum allowable speed. This will necessitate eliminating stops because stops create backups. As a result, Caltrain will look to close small stations. This makes weekday service at Atherton Station highly unlikely and gives the town leverage in negotiations with Caltrain. It's a problem of physics. The Caltrain station in Atherton is dangerous in its current configuration. Anyone can wander onto the tracks from the at-grade boarding areas. Also, passengers must cross over the southbound track to board or disembark northbound trains. With increased numbers of people from the new Civic Center and Library, and if weekday service were to be resumed, the risk posed by the Atherton Station's unsafe configuration would increase. Significant funds are necessary to upgrade this holdout station. These funds would be better spent to improve the intensely used stations such as Redwood City, Palo Alto and Menlo Park where significant numbers of commuters could benefit. The town should further silence train horn noise by leveraging its potential to remove from Caltrain the operation and the financial burdens stated above which are associated with having to stop at Atherton Station if weekday service were to be resumed and if the station were to be made safe for passengers. As long as the station is open, Caltrain retains the right and will continue to sound horns for the length of the station platform in both directions. The town should seek to close the Atherton station and proactively negotiate with Caltrain to significantly decrease train horn noise and improve safety around the new Civic Center and adjacent neighborhoods. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Are there other uh, nominations for uh, uh, impacts? Impacts. Spoon. Is the ex oh, I'm sorry. I, I just jumped in. Um, she added something that I was going to point out is the the current status of it as a holdout station. So okay. in your list, you should probably add holdout station, which has been a long term yeah. safety issue. Right. Well, and. It, it, it will be until it's fixed. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to add is um, uh, I think our population density uh, near the station is uh, relatively low relative to other stations in the area. So um, uh, while, I, while I'm mostly in favor of closing the station, uh, I think a potential compromise if Caltrain uh, wanted to do this would be to actually move uh, the station, close this one, and uh, move it a little bit further north. Okay, we'll we'll get we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, that that's a uh, that's a strategy. It's not a measure. Okay, this way. I suppose another impact is is traffic issues to the extent that stopping here keeps the gates down longer. Okay. Say it again. Yeah. Traffic. If, if Trains stop here, the gates are down longer. There's the trains go on through. Than if they just barrel. Yeah, through. yes. Well, I don't think it's a big deal, but it's, I mean, it's, well, it, it's, it's a small difference to a terrible situation. As the train situation. traffic grows, it will yeah. become a big deal. Well, it's a big deal, but it's, anyway, yes. it's, there's okay. a slight difference whether they stop or not. That's, that's, that's valid. You know, Alex, I think, had something to say. Alex, did you want to kick in here? Yeah. 
Yeah, one of uh, one of kind of the things about uh, our initiatives we want is you know if we want regular weekday service, um, more regular weekday service is that uh, to do that the way Caltrain is doing that for other stations that are um, doing a lot, they want to increase the number of stops at the station. They're building passing tracks, so uh, you'll see in the plans they're um, is drawing up you know which stations will get you know four tracks instead of just the regular two, and that will allow passing trains to go by, and then the slower trains can stop at those stations and let those passing guys go, and that will facilitate having more stops. Um, the challenge I think for Atherton um, is that we we don't want I guess in general most. I guess right now it's a policy that we don't want more tracks. I think most people don't want more tracks. And if we don't, if there are no more tracks, there's never going to be a lot more service on, on the weekdays. There's always going to be something we're going to have to take away from Menlo Park or Redwood City because they don't want, uh, Caltrain doesn't want to put uh, uh, more, uh, more trains where there's only two tracks available and no passing allowed. So that's one of the things we should think about too, is that we may never ever get uh, real regular weekday service if there's never more than two tracks. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Paul. Yes, Craig. You know, I, I, my thinking is not solidified, so, but I just know that the two cities south of us, Menlo Park and Palo Alto, are right in the midst of deciding where to put the great separations. Mm -hmm. And they're reaching out. That, to, that's on our agenda later, Craig. Right, but I think it impacts the fact of whether you keep the station open or not, how you deal with the great separation. And I, I just, I don't know whether the, what the priority should be. And I think the other thing is the SB50, I think is crucial in making the decision. Because if SB50 goes away, then I think it's a whole different perspective on the importance of the station that it would be that if it passes, and and I think the likelihood of it passing, and to discuss last night at the city of Palo Alto, the lobbyist was not, <coughs> he wasn't overly concerned that it would pass, but on the other hand, he felt it was a better chance of passing than it did last year, mm -hmm. where it failed. It but, didn't get out of committee last right, year. Right, didn't get out of committee, but I, I think the governor is, is very strong supporting housing and things have changed, but again, if the, if the SB 50 went away, I don't know that I would affect, that I would want to close the station for the other reasons. So I, I, I guess the question, in order of priority, I think SB 50 first, and then the rail, the great separations of the other two towns next to us, second. Because if they want us to join them in doing something, whether it's building a trench or helping conform to their, because Meadow Park is definitely, I think, going to go three intersections. No, that nothing is definite. You well, came to that well meeting, I know, but I it's, it's more likely thing. than not. It's Let's put it that way. all up in the air. But I, I think they, they're going to do something. But I, it's got to, they got to do Ravens with Something, something will be done, but let, let's But it's going to impact us is all I'm saying. So I think it would be good to know what they're going to do before we make a final decision, but I don't know whether we can wait because if SB 50 comes along, we need to decide now. What we want at the moment from Menlo Park is a Caltrain track at grade entering the town of Atherton. And what they do with it in the way of grade separations back down the line is of interest to us, but it's not crucial. Uh, I have a question. So we're focused right now on 5E, but is the, the, the scope of this meeting and the interest of the, the town council is to provide feedback, a comprehensive feedback on what the, the town's policy should that, be regarding rail? That's where we're headed. Okay. Have, let's, let's accept the uh, impacts that we've listed. I think they're probably adequate. Now we have the question of formulating different future services. Can I mention another impact? Uh, go ahead, Jack. It hasn't come up yet in the discussion about the, what to recommend to the council, but I think a, a big consideration, although I also think it'll never happen, is high-speed rail. And I think the town 
probably ought to be on record as not wanting high-speed rail to come through the town. I think we're on that on record for that all the time. We've been fighting it from the very start. We should continue to be. We, we will not back away from that, Jack. I promise you. At least not while I'm alive, which is going to be at least the next couple of weeks. So. <laughs> we pray for your continued yeah. need Thank you. Now, looking at uh, different future services, the, the first and obvious one is restore full service to, to weekday service as well as <coughs> weekend service to the extent that we can get Caltrain to serve the town. Another is the one that uh, you folks, you guests have brought up uh, closing the station. That, that's another scenario. And the third one was the thing that uh, uh, Scott just, just raised, the issue that he just raised, and that is to move the station up into the North Fair Oaks area where it would be roughly midway between the Atherton yes. station and the Redwood City station. It would, uh, it would be a little more than uh, a mile north of us and a little more than a mile south from their station. And that, that is another option. Are there other future scenarios that, that you can imagine for our Atherton yes. Rail Service that you'd like to put into the review? Well, I'm curious that's how, that, how, how, that how that suggestion, how that would work out. We've got a bunch of houses there. Moving the station, or? It would, it would go up near the Dumbarton uh, okay. cutoff. That, that's the area. There is some vacant land there, but some houses would have to be taken. It's Which side of Fifth Avenue is that? I don't even know. That would be on this side of Fifth Avenue. Avenue. I suppose one option is business as it is now. I mean, I know when you say service, you okay. said weekday plus weekend, we could keep the weekend we service. We could keep the weekend now. service. So, if, Paul, if you don't mind. Um, in the staff report, we provided some options for consideration. Um, that includes, as uh, you said, just retain the existing weekend service. It's roughly every hour and a half during the weekend. It's presumably going back to an hour after they get through with their electrification. Um, you know, if you're considering the addition of weekday service, it can be done in a number of ways. One is, you know, hourly service all day during the weekdays. Our, um, have that hourly service during the weekdays plus half hours for the commute hours, or just simply asking for adding half hourly or something like that during commute hours only, or as you were discussing closure. These are levels of options that can be considered um, just to kind of add to yeah. the other items. But the, the level of service is something that has to be negotiated with That's health. correct. It's not something that we can, uh, if we say this is what we want, it's, a, it's at best a starting point. So I would like to, if we can, keep the restore, restore uh, full week, weekday service or restore weekday service as a single option because we can't, we can't really make a decision here about what that can be. Paul, you yes, Kerry. Uh, you, uh, just a point of clarity, on moving the station, are you referring to Roland LeBlanc's uh, position of moving the station north? to the transportation hub to Bitcoin for the Dunbarton Quarter of that he, location? He mentioned that, and it's essentially the same location. Okay. Uh, we, we haven't heard from uh, Scott on the uh, Dunbarton Corridor yet because we skipped to this item first. But that that is a potential a value of, okay. of that uh, repositioning the station. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm just curious, has the town, have, has this committee considered the possibility of purchasing the structure that we all love from Caltrans and any uh, other property that we'd like to incorporate into our town center? Well, this, this would come up later. Oh. The, we're not talking about destroying the station, and I, I don't think it's likely that if the station is moved that that structure will be moved with it, but it's possible. It, it could be moved. 
Okay, now we come to the point of uh, evaluating the, the different options. Let, let's start with the restore service. Uh, the, the service then re provides train service on weekdays to the, to the town of Atherton. Uh, it uh, would continue the noise of the train horns going through the station that you folks have complained about very uh, eloquently this evening, <laughs> but that would continue to go on. It would uh, put stress on the uh, parking supply in conjunction with the town center structure, but there, you know, a, uh, a parking structure could be erected. It's possible that something like that could be done, though it's not contemplated at the moment. Uh, the uh, access to the station would be as it is today. Uh, the uh, possibility of, of uh, high density housing would uh, ride with uh, SB 50 or whatever else is done. There, uh, there could be some higher density structures if, if it becomes necessary to do so. So that would remain an uncertainty. Uh, Malcolm, would you comment on that? You're, you're wanting to say something. <laughs> I'm listening. Well, uh, I disagree with so much of what I've heard. Um, when we moved to Atherton in 1961, we returned from London, uh, served on the command staff, and we lived 17 miles out of town in Harrow on the Hill, which is where Churchill went to school, and it was yes. a wonderful place. And I think I drove once into London to uh, duty into the embassy, and it took me only one time to realize that was not the way to try to get into the, to work. And so, um, we, uh, I took the train every day from North Harrow out to, uh, down to Baker Street and walked a pleasant walk up to Grover Square. And, uh, Did you take the train or the underground? The underground goes out there. Took, well, it's, uh, it's above ground there. As you get yes, into town, the Baker but Street, you go to it, it was above ground. Okay. And, uh, I learned that that's the way to travel. The comfort of it, you can your leisure, you read what you want to read. And, uh, so when we came here, we, in making the decision to move to Athens or to this area, my wife said, when we move back to the States, we're going to live in a university town, University of Palo Alto area. So that's what brought us to here. And uh, then my office was in San Francisco, and I being very used to using the train as my way of getting to and from work, uh, that was the, a major motivation for us. We bought a home over at 65 Maple, about a, you know, a block from the station. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's interesting, if people would come to our home in the evening, they told oh, there's a train. We never heard the train after the first two weeks. It, this was not an issue, we never heard it at all. We lived right here. And we lived here because it was the convenience of having that kind of transit to the city. Mm -hmm. um, and with the interest I've had, with transit and recognizing it's even worse now with congestion with cars and all that uh, it's so critical for us to have an alternative to the automobile and the train is a very important <laughs> part of that and it's had a long history for our town uh, you know in 1866 152 years ago we had train service here in Afton it was a drop service and um, the first train station actually was a year later it was Menlo Park so we have a long, long history, and uh, Jim doesn't make maybe history is quite as important, but uh, but there is a long history. <laughs> the value, and it was we had service here 50 years before we ever became a city, and um, so there is a long history, and I think that, uh, that as, as we think of the issues that have come before us in town, uh, preservation is certainly a high priority. And that's been true with so many things we've done. Um, even things like, um, that we've always had a lot of pressure on the streets to widen our streets. Great pressures uh, on uh, Middlefield, great pressures on Marsh Road, great pressures on Alameda. And we felt it was valued to, to retain the character of this town, and that's been part of it. 
and a lot of other things we've done that uh, dealt with the pressures to change the, the basic character of the town. And so for me, uh, and having been very involved, and I won't go into more of that, but um, the train is a very valuable asset to the town. And I think it would be very unfortunate if we were to lose that. Um, I, I know SB50 is a concern people have, but it's not going to impact us with the train unless we do have weekday service. And uh, the fact is that uh, what the intent is to have affordable housing, higher density tra uh, housing in areas where there is access to transit. We don't have transit during the week. I would hope ultimately we're going to, if we look back at the electrification EIR, uh, they projected 54 stops a day. Um, more recently, the, the business plan certainly doesn't lay it out that way. But I think that uh, for one thing, if we were to, uh, if we eliminated service now, I think it would be a huge mistake. It's a valuable asset to the town. And um, so if, if SB doesn't pass, uh, then I would be all in favor, certainly, of restoring the service we've had over the years. I think it's very important to the town. Uh, if it did pass, then I don't think there's any impact on us. Just like with buses, the buses, we have two lines, Middlefield and El Camino. Uh, they won't affect us because we're not within that 15 minutes, just as the train wouldn't affect us if we're not, you know, if you don't have any service during the week, that's not gonna be an issue. So I think that from my perspective, if we were to go, if SB 50 did pass, I'd say we stay with what we have right now. Stay with we, and to me, we that's valuable. When I, when I go to the Giants games, things like that, I always obviously come from, from the afternoon station. If it's during the week, I have to go to Menlo Park, and that doesn't work very well. For me, I have never found parking there. Maybe the wrong time, so I parked on the street somewhere. Um, and it's not that it's that much more distant, but, um, and the fact is, we do pay for this train service. Our residents, their sales tax, put in over 500,000 every year. We put in over $9 million for the, for the 20 years, just the first period of Measure A. And so, I would hope that we do nothing at this point in terms of our service levels. And if SB 50, I think we have to make a decision. At that point, I think I would be inclined. I would hate losing the weekday service. But I would be inclined to stay with the weekend service. That's at least better than nothing. Uh, now, I would say this. If, indeed, we're going to make such a major change to depart from something that has that much history with this town, 150 years of service to us, I would strongly urge the town to go to a survey of the town because it would be a very different result than people living here. Even though I lived right here, just a block away, I think you would have a very different result. And I think if you're going to make a decision like that, which really negatively, in my opinion, affects this town and all we put into an investment we made in that, it ought to be going to the entire community. That would be wrong if we didn't. When we dealt with the Dumbarton Bridge issue, the highway bridge, we did a survey and that was very important because you really got a sense of what the community really was. So I think that my feeling is at this point, uh, there's no reason to make any recommendation in terms of change of our service. If SB 50 passes, then I think we do need to think about that. And at that point, for me personally, I would be in favor of, of not having the weekday service. But if it doesn't pass, and SB 50 is not the only issue, as we know, all over the country, they're making changes. I mean, that uh, it's gonna be not related just to transit or jobs or that sort of thing. Uh, we all, we're going to face that. We know that. It's happening. It's happened already in San Francisco um, and other states. And so uh, SP50 is only one part of the issue dealing with the problems of, of housing. If we have three and a half million shortage of housing in California, clearly it's a problem. We need to deal with these kind of things. We ought to all be concerned about that. But um, for Atherton, uh, we have a service that I think has been very valuable to us over the years. For me personally, of course, I've worked in this for a long, long time. And um, uh, I would hate to see us do that if we were to do that, make that kind of a decision. I had another occasion where we had a plan to have a pool in the park. And um, uh, there was, uh, at the, the old days at the park, I did a survey of people there. And it was like 95%, it's a great idea. So I felt, well, this is, I guess, 
the community should be behind it. I didn't personally care about, about that issue, but uh, we were asked by Dick Moore, who was the city manager at the time, to do this. The president of the Dames also favored that, and I was surprised, but she did. And so we were moving along with the plans, we are going to go for bids, and my good friend John Bakersfield said, now he used to sit there as a judge when the town had a judge. We were the only time the town ever had a judge. And he had this booming voice and he'd said, I think it's a crazy idea. Well, I, I thought, well, you know, <laughs> I, I was confident, but based on the survey we had done with a limited number at the park, that everybody favored that. We did a survey and 80% or so said no, and so we didn't do it. That was the end of it. And then John, he and his wife Clara would often come with me to the Council of Mayors, and he came after it was after we didn't proceed with it. And he gave me this package, a nice gift. I said, well, what's this for? He said, I want it for you. And so I said, am I supposed to open it? I did. There was this editorial from the Almanac with an empty pool and me sitting on the edge of the string tied to a boat on the little sailboat <laughs> of the trip. And I thought, and he signed it. He said, best friends, you know, political differences never come between good friends. And that was how, you know, how things used to work. And, uh, so, but it, the survey told us, where is the community? I mean, it's fine for us to have our own personal opinions, but if the community at large has a feeling, I think we want to be responsive to that. So to me, I think it'd be a huge mistake to make any recommendation of a change tonight until we see what happens with SB 50, meet again on that, and if we were going to change the service, I think we need to know what the community feels, because I frankly think, I may be wrong, but I think the broader community would feel that it was a service we should maintain. Well, thank you, Malcolm. So, so I do have one follow-up. So, so Malcolm um, suggested that we not change, but I think we need yeah. to make a, a definition of what change is. I, I believe the current policy for the town is that we support and advocate for full service. No, no, no not, not change the service. Okay. He was talking about service, not, not the town position. We haven't come okay. to that yet. Okay, I got you. But you're right, I, I put another option in here called do nothing, uh, which is keep the weekend service and nothing more. Okay. So now we have... Uh, oh, may I just... Uh, just a just second, let me Thank finish you. what I'm saying, please. Sorry. We, we now have uh, uh, four, four options that we're looking at mm -hmm. instead of the three. Mm -hmm. Now, go ahead, Marissa. Thank you, Paul. Sorry to interrupt. I wanted to say, Malcolm, you had said that if SB 50 passes, that you would then be in favor of closing the station. I no. wanted to uh, Not closing it. We're retaining only weekend service, not doing it with closing. Right. But I was going to get into that because you were said that we would be exempt if the station only had weekend service. That is not accurate. The official California legislative uh, website which I have here, I printed out today. This is the SB 50 bill as it is today, right now. It is any train station, any level of service. Any level? Any level of service. That's the worry? Any level of service, any existing tra train station, whether that train station is serviced either by a train or bus service, period. That is the that is not changed. It applies to every single station. Even if your station is like Broadway, where there's no train service and there's just bus service. They so have weekend service also. Well, they, but it's a bus. The point is that it's not dependent on your level of service. If you have a station no, and service by train or bus, you are, you are applicable to <coughs> SB 50. But that's period. not what the staff member said to me. Well, I can only go okay. by what the legislation well, says. Right. Yes. So I actually printed out as well. It's very clear that it says major transit stop, which from which all this stems from. We need to stop between an existing rail transit station or a ferry terminal served by either bus or transit, or rail transit service, period. There's no limitations. There's no sub-definition for a rail transit service. I have the attorney. It's not my specialty, but I, I didn't see any sub-limitation in any of the definitions for that. Paul. Last night, the lobbyist recommended, rather than oppose the bill, that you amend it. And if we amended it to say, only if the service was within the 15 minutes, like the bus service is, during the week, during the week, 
that we would be exempt from SB 50 by still keeping the station open by amending the bill. Because I think the bill is going to be amended a lot. And I'm just saying, the lobbyist in Palo Alto suggested that the city council not oppose the bill, but to a, a, a support it if amended. And I think our amendment would be that if they gave an exemption for train service, if there were no train service during the week, or, uh, you know, that it would, we, I mean, the purpose of the, of the bill is to support commuters who are going to work. And if they aren't going to work, then there's no need to, to uh, exactly. enforce the bill. Well, oh, I know, but the housing is supposed to, for the people who are going to commute to work. No, and I'm just saying no, that. No, and low income as well. No, the purpose of that, it's not a transit bill. It is a housing bill. And the purpose of the housing, as this lady said, is to promote as many and as quickly as possible mixed income housing. That is the sole purpose of the bill. The only reason that bus stations and train stations are mentioned is because the developers are given the incentive of not having to provide any parking spaces. And the rationale is that, well, you're near a station, you're near a bus, a highly serviced bus station stop and therefore cars would not be necessary <coughs> so we're waiving the requirement to provide any parking at all and that's a tremendous financial incentive to a developer because he does not have to pay for the land for parking and he would not have to pay the twenty thousand dollars on top of that for a structured parking space but if we put our caveat on our closing the station that if they amended the bill to exempt us because we don't have weekly service then we would be satisfied I mean, I think we're, if we vote tonight to close this station, that's going to send a, a political message to Sacramento that you haven't seen in a long time. So I think that if you want to have a, uh, an impact that's likely to maybe be accommodated, would be to have an amendment to get us off their back. So I mean, I'm a Actually, politician. I think the Actually, it might be the opposite. If we vote to close the station, that will send them the message that they will amend the bill. So if we don't do anything, they, there won't be any message. So if we, no, we I don't know, do if we it. actually we send them, we, we actually the station do something drastic. But we, the purpose of the bill is not, the purpose of the bill is not to exempt small, uh, any town or any station with a little service or medium service. The purpose of the bill is to promote as much mixed income housing as is physically possible and as quickly as possible, period. That is the intent of the legislation. <coughs> and the legislation was recently endorsed by the Association of Bay Area Governments. And they reference SB 50, and they go so far as to say seven-story buildings should be allowed to be built. Say again. They go so far, the, the Association of Bay Area Bay Bay. Uh, Governments, ABEG, goes so far as to say they are in favor of building seven-story buildings within the area surrounding the train station. They are all for promoting mixed income housing. That's, that is the bottom line. This is, not, this is not a transit bill. It is not a bill to, to provide any funding. It is a bill for the state to be able to incent developers to provide as much housing as possible that is of a mixed income, that is a requirement, and not for the state not to have to spend any money. That is the purpose of the bill. It will absolutely, contrary to the intent of the legislation, to exempt anybody based on service levels. And for them to suggest that they're going to do that, <coughs> is disingenuous because the purpose of the bill is to build as much housing as possible. That is stated very clearly. I, 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 um, I support uh, uh, virtually everything that, that she uh, just said, although there, I think there's one caveat that we need to consider is that I, I think that the that there's that there's always going to be assembly bills and senate bills coming down the pipe and, uh, and, and uh, I think we should avoid being too reactive to them. Just, you know, 
uh, SP 50 might pass, it might pass amended, it might fail in committee, just like I think it was SB 728 last year. 827. Okay, thank you. Um, I actually think there's a lot of data, uh, regardless of SB 50, that we can make an informed decision about the merits of the station without SB 50 even being part of the equation. I, 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 I know that there's concern about it, I, I share those concerns. But I think we can actually make an informed decision about the merits of the station without even uh, SB 50 being in. And I don't think it should be a part of the discussion just simply because there can be future bills that we can't possibly predict. So I think we should just um, make a decision on the station based on its own merits. I agree completely. I agree. Are we going to have separate discussion on SB 50? No, no not so any more than we've had. Okay, it's not our bill. And that is why I didn't mention in my statement. This, yeah, is, I avoided it too, right? this is just moved into the discussion, Jack. That was not intended. Well, well, I think that drove the whole I issue. I think SB50 is in the is background, a, and we're all a, aware of is a bigger it. And we're issue all aware to, of pressure on building high density not housing. Closing or opening the station. But, you know, as, as Scott and others have pointed out, it, it may not pass this year, but it may come out next year. We have no way of predicting what's going to happen in the future. As long as there is population pressure in California, there's going to be housing pressure, and we can't avoid it. So we need to make our, our station decision independent of that to the extent that we can. Well, if we're not going to have a separate discussion on SB 50, I'd like to talk about it now. Uh, as far as we develop a recommendation to the council, I think we should withhold any recommendation on discontinuing train service until we know what the result of SB 50 is. Well, we could continue our decision if SB 50 passes. We could we close the station. Decision. We could move to close it, but only if SB 50 passes. Yeah, well, you know, we, we can postpone this forever, Jack. And you and I won't live forever. No. no. A few more weeks. We were born we're the okay. same month, so we're but we could condition the same age. <coughs> we could condition it. We would recommend closing the station if SB 50 passes in its present form. I think that this Congress the, the problem is that it won't be our decision to close. It'll be Caltrain. And if you want to start the conversation, yeah. Yeah. it's going to take a while. For, it oh, it's Caltrain's, Caltrain's decision, decision to close. To close and I, I think that, you know, this, the charge of this committee is focused on rail. The council will have other conversations with regards to uh, proposed legislation and housing and other requirements that are imposed by the state. Um, and the council has asked this committee to try and formulate its recommendations on what kind of rail service is desired. Do you agree with that, Gary? Um, remember that the trigger of this is not SB 50. The trigger of this is Caltrain's current business plan and the ridership volume and number of trains mm -hmm. that they're putting on the corridor, which will heavily impact the corridor. So that right, if you look at the business plan and all those potential options for service. And if you notice that Atherton and, uh, there's Atherton and Broadway both have question marks yeah. continued service. No service. Remember if you actually absorb the depth of that, the volume of trains that are going in each direction based on the predictability of the volume of people that are going to be on those trains um, is what is targeting this conversation. Uh, SB 50 is a separate issue. Volume of trains, downtime, gate time, noise, those are all things that potentially are in play here. Obviously, Caltrain wanting to have a discussion because of the fact that it also triggers money into the station just to have trains go through the station in a manner that if there is a stop. So remember that we have to, there's a lot of people that are actually in the center of our tracks. So those are all little things before they start spending money on the station. And the probability is that we may not in the near future have service, even though they may give it to us today. It may not be when they actually increase the volume of people on the trains, that they start making decisions on the trains that are not, the stations that are not heavily used. 
that could be something down the road that they would close it at their discretion either way. So that, that's how this is coming up. Not SB 50, separate issue. Well, they are the. Uh, if the priority is the 2040 business plan, mm -hmm. uh, I haven't seen any full text of it. I've seen slide presentations of it. I don't, don't know if they have a full text. But anyway, does the 2040 plan provide for high-speed rail? No. They, they does acknowledge it. Assume it. They, no acknowledge it rail? they don't have it included in their plan. They acknowledge it, and they acknowledge it at four trains per four hour. Four trains per hour. Each direction. Yeah, but those, those extra four trains per hour would really Oh, it's Not huge. everything for a loop. Well, they're huge. getting, they're talking about two minute headways, Jack, which I don't think they can ever achieve. Uh, with the car structure they have, and the stations, and bicycles, and handicapped people, and the sorts of things that, that uh, make it impossible to operate on a precise schedule. If you're running a New York subway, you can do this because you've got level boarding and people are all standing and they're very agile because that's the only way they survive. <laughs> but for Caltrain, the kind of service they have, I don't think they can do it, but that's in their plan. Also, the New York City subway, I must say, because I, I'm from Manhattan. The New York City subway travels so rapidly. Those stops are far apart. They're not stopping at the bridge. Uh, oh, of course not. That, that is a shock. It is six miles from Midtown to Wall Street. That's a, yeah. You can't possibly sit in a cab for that during rush hour. I mean, you'd be there for days. Mm -hmm. So it's those stops are very, very long. And my point is the law of physics is exactly as you said. When you're talking about Caltrain putting in these very short two-minute headways, as soon as you stop adding stops, a whole system backs up. That's and that's right. why it's not practical. It's just a law of physics. That's right. They, it, it, it will never happen. No. Uh, but that's, well, I'm not sure they're, uh, they're very optimistic. Uh, passenger projections are going to eventuate either. But the fact remains that the utility of an automobile is going down steadily as with the passage of time because of the overload of traffic on uh, local streets as well as arterials and freeways. And so that the, the luxury of driving a car is going to uh, become unbearable for many people for either uh, travel time reasons or uh, cost reasons. So the, the future of transportation in the Bay Area is going to change. And we're looking at something that we think will help Atherton survive into the future. We can't solve every problem that will come along, but we can look at our own local problems and, and see what <coughs> makes sense for us as, as, uh, as, as temporary target issues. And is that, are, are we still focused on uh, suggested service options? Yes, we are. Okay. Can I make a, a and I know not everyone agrees with this, but in, in the list that I'm looking at that was provided by um, staff, the, yes. the five options, um, I, I personally think of all five of them, you know, there I can see a, a theoretical perfect alignment where service is high enough. Um, to be of interest to Caltrain and of interest to us, but I think it's very unlikely we'll ever achieve that. But but of this list, that I think is the, the worst option is the, the current state. In my opinion, we get the worst of both options. We get all of the, the noise associated with having a station, um, but we get very little of the service. Mm -hmm. in, in my opinion, uh, uh, I would almost prefer that we keep our, our standard of, of, of trying to have full service rather than live with what we have now. Okay, well you're, you're speaking directly against Malcolm. So yeah, I, I do respectfully disagree with holding the okay, course. Okay, that's, well, that's like, fine. I, like, I mean, I, I, while I'm, I'm an advocate of either closing or moving the station, uh, I would be less opposed to trying to have full service than having what we have now. Okay. At least full service gives us the benefit of actually having a station that we can use. 
Like the, the, the service is so poor now that even during the weekend, I used to use it at least occasionally. Now it's so poor, I can't use it at all. I, I would have to ride it once, be out all night, and then get home six hours later because an hour and a half is just, is, it's worthless. Well, the, the hour and a half is during the electrification. Yeah, and that's presumably true. we'll it was, go back to hourly service, which is an improvement, yeah. but it doesn't make it good. Yeah. Uh, John. <coughs> Uh, there's a, a dimension to this that I don't think has been addressed, and it, the ice may be kind of thin on it, I don't know. But Greg talked about recommendations might send a message to Sacramento. Mm -hmm. The recommendation will also send a message to Caltrain. Yes. And I think that's an important element. I think if we recommend closing the station, you know, there'll be champagne corks popping at Caltrain headquarters. If we want any leverage with them, with regard to what happens to the property, with regards to maintaining some level of service, if some level of service is desirable, I don't think we can recommend, well, just close it because it'll be quieter. Uh, I, I think we ought to make I mean, I'm inclined to agree with Malcolm this, and I, I know Jim's not a big fan of history and nostalgia, but there, there is an element to it uh, that you know, train service is nice. I don't think we'll ever get back to the full service that we had. I think that's a pipe dream. But I think the existence of some level of rail transit in Africa is, as you said, a valuable asset desirable asset. Now, okay. I think most of the people in this room disagree with that, but I don't care. But I think we ought to try and keep the pressure on Caltrain. So if it does come to the point where they say, I'm sorry, we just can't stop here anymore, they have at least have to fight for it. And they, we can, they don't. They can close the state. Well, they they closed it 14 years ago. Well, no, they reduced service 14 years ago, and they have been consistently promising in public fora that they would return, re put it back. They can't just, I mean, of course they can. They can. <laughs> but I think we should not cave into that without some sort of an effort. I would like to, uh, whether it's continuing with what I think is the current council recommendation, restore full service, I mean, I... You know, I don't think we'll ever get that, but if Caltrain says, gee, they're going to keep fighting for that, that's one thing. If we say retain the current thing, it may be the worst of all worlds, but it's something that Caltrain has to deal with. And I think we ought to think about that. Thank there you. is Thank another you, effect, and that is that we could get full serve if we wanted to increase the ridership, and we can do that. I'm not sure that the neighbors in this neighborhood would like that to happen, but Facebook was very receptive to having a shuttle from our station to the campus. It worked well for them, and it worked well for us in terms of increasing ridership, but that was our goal. Um, and that, that's one reality, and we could do that. I don't think that's what we want to do. I think we'd like to go back to where it was, getting the kind of service we used to have, uh, but we could increase ridership. And I, I will add one thing that has nothing to do with the service here. To me, the biggest negatives have nothing to do with our service. One is, electrification is going to result in ugly catenaries. That is a negative impact without any benefit. That's a reality. That's, that's one of them. Uh, another one would be if we were to have a berm up and down like they have in Del Belmont and San Carlos. And I can tell you there's a lot of support for that. You may have seen in the press Tom Huning, who was with us on, with me on Transportation Authority and LAFCO. That was his preference for the, whole, for the whole county, not just this area. And what you do know is that you're not going to have, you know, Bel or Mel Mendel Park here and here and then Redwood City Center. It's going to be the same. And we don't have much leverage as a town, as we know from our past experiences. We could end up with a berm, which I spent 20 number of years on the TA in LAFCO, and I never saw the kind of opposition that I saw to the, to the burn through Belmont and San Carlos from the businesses there it really impacted them. 
We heard screams, and they said, like, don't let this happen. Well, it continues to impact them. I'm sure it does, but I mean, I, I was there at the time that we were hearing from them, and the people living along there. I mean, maybe good people don't mind that, but if you can visualize a berm running through Atherton. We, we do not want a berm. Well, That's I what I'm saying, I'm just saying. I don't think there's any question about that. But I don't think we're going to have that much control uh, if, if our neighbors want it. Hopefully they don't, if, if, if both Mineral Park and Redwood City favored that. Having been part of the process, I understand what's going to happen there to us. All I'm saying is that there are things that, to me, would be a real concern in terms of negative impacts on us, but not related to the service at all. To me, the service is a major plus. I find it very helpful on weekends to be able to get on that and go to the Giants game and come back on there. It's been, that's the main thing I do with the train here. It's only on the weekends, but that to me is a major plus. I've worked very, very hard over the years, as you know, on making it possible for us to have a train at all up and down the peninsula. And um, to me, the loss of that would be a real major loss to us. Uh, but there are some negative impacts coming down the road. The catenaries will be there with electrification. That was never, I mean, electrification was never favored by the staff. We, you know, we fought that to oh, the nail all down the line. Steve Schmidt was a, a friend in Menlo Park. He was on the Menlo Council, and he was also on Sam Trans and TA, JPB, rather. And um, that was his idea. And, that, uh, and, and there were good points for it. But uh, that is going to be a real negative impact, which was no benefit to us. That is a negative, and the burn would be a negative. And I do think that will happen, frankly. I hope it doesn't. I don't want it, and it wouldn't be good for us aesthetically. And all. So I think there are things that we ought to be concerned about, those kind of things, and ought to be able to do. And I think, as Don suggested, if we're still part of the whole thing, we will at least have some input. It may not be that effective, but if we're part of it, if we're not part of it, hey, and I can speak from experience on that. But we will not have any input. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Malcolm. May I just add one final point to Malcolm's? And that is why in my remarks I suggested that we could say to Caltrain, let us get out of your way. Let us stop being an operational burden, which is go let us eliminate the small station stop, which is going to impede your ability <coughs> to have a closer spacing and run more trains accordingly. Let it eliminate that small station stop. That will help you with your plan to increase the number of trains by having shorter headways, physical distances. Let us also eliminate the potential financial burden of having to upgrade this unsafe holdout station. Those are two negotiating points of leverage that we have right now with Caltrain. And that is why I suggest that we try to use those two points of leverage to try to get something positive out of this while we still have that point of leverage. As time goes by, our leverage will decrease. But I agree with you, and that was my point to John. We don't have a lot of say. This is up to Caltrain. Let us take what we have now as a point of leverage. Let us say to Caltrain, we can save the money from upgrading the station. They have no plans right now to upgrade that station. It's too expensive. Let us take away the small station stop they have in their 2040 plan. That station service to Atherton is strictly to be determined. Same thing with College Park. They know they can't service small stations. We have some leverage there with these two What is the leverage to do what? To remove the financial and operational burden that is associated with stopping in Atherton and well, that's not leverage for us. That's leverage yeah, for them. It, it's the cost of the of eliminating the, uh, the holdout rule. Why not? But that's not a benefit to us. It's you're no, you're you're, not you're not caving into them, no. giving them everything they want right. or nothing. No. You're not no, getting no, no. anything. Right. What my whole point is is Malcolm was saying, and John, we do not have a lot of leverage, but we have leverage now on two critical points. Let us use that. We can say to Caltrain, let us remove Atherton as a operational uh, problem for you. Let us remove the Atherton station as a financial burden to you. The financial burden that we would be removing is having to upgrade an unsafe holdout station. That is a point of leverage that we could use to negotiate with Caltrain. To negotiate what? 
The second point is we would remove the operational problem of their having to stop at a small station, which is little used. They can increase then more, they could run more trains. And that is the point that I laid out based on the law of physics. We could ask the town, we could authorize the town to begin negotiations, and the town could then use those two critical points of leverage, which are significant advantages to Caltrain, and we could get something for that that would be positive for the future of the town, and it would eliminate the noise impact for residents that have to live here, it would eliminate the noise impact of the Civic Center, the library, and it would eliminate the danger of people being able to wander right now onto the tracks, which will only become a bigger problem as the Civic Center and new library come here. I mean, that, those are points eventually in a negotiation, but we can't offer them. Once we offer them, the, the negotiation's over. They right. have to ask for it. And so we have to say we, we want to We've got to ask for something in return. Well, we have some things we could ask for in return, but if we keep saying we'd like some service here, and they come and they say, well, you know, we've got this. May I finish, please? I think we have to continue to request some form of service. If Caltrain wants to come and say, hey, you know, you cost us a lot, you give us problems with headway, you give us problems with refurbishing the station, you say, oh, well, you would, if you want something from us, fine. But I don't think we can go and say, well, we'll close the station and you get this in return and so now you've got to be nice to us. They won't be nice to us, they'll just end the conversation. Well, the whole I mean, that's a negotiating tactic. I'm not disagreeing with any of your facts. <laughs> The whole that we had that in the budget. Uh, that would have, it's not a big thing. The, the program for the whole system is to eliminate all holdout stations for obvious reasons. It's not all that expensive. And uh, so that I don't think is, it's not an issue uh, from the perspective of the authority, the TA in this case. And um, so it just, the benefit we get is having service, and the cost, operating cost of stopping here and loading for the number of stops they, that we have is not a big issue. And frankly, financially, we're the contributors. We, we're putting 547,000 plus every year into that system for service that we're not getting. We're making the investment. What are we getting for it? And we're going to get some negative impact regardless whether it's service or not. And you're right, we may not get a high level of service. That's possible. But I, I can tell you this, I think our lawyer is not alive now, but he was on the JPB, the, the civilian member, citizen member. And he worked out with me the kind of scheduling that would work and give us the opportunity to have a significant increase in ridership because it would get back to what we had with the kids coming here with their shuttles to go to Pastelea and other schools, that's where we had the loss in the ridership. They, they did that, and that was because they wanted to eliminate our service. I mean, even the, uh, Michael Scanlon, who was the director, and he used our station, that was his one, he lived over in Selby, on appropriate area. And he said, don't complain about cutting out the key service for you, we want, <laughs> our staff wants to. Uh, <laughs> they wanted to eliminate service altogether. And so, he said, don't complain about a cutback. So, anyway, it's, to me, we've had a long struggle to have service. I think it's very important to the town. It's a great asset. It's valuable to us. We're paying. I don't think we mind paying as long as we're getting something for it. And uh, I wouldn't worry that they're going to have to spend some money hold up. That's in the program for the whole system. And that isn't that expensive. And it should have been done long ago. And it would have been. It was in the budget. Unfortunately, I retired from the staff at the time that it was going to be done. And then my replacement, uh, I shouldn't get all that. But anyway, uh, so it was taken out of the budget. But it was there. So that's not a big issue at all. Financially, we're contributors. And we ought to get something for that. 
and the train service is important and very valuable. Okay, I, I if, think if, we're if, if pretty Caltrain's much objective is to get more trains per hour during the rush hour, closing the Atherton station on some trips isn't going to make that much difference. It's it's peanuts. It's two minutes out of. Well, it, it's <coughs> it's another stop. It's a, yeah, that means Redwood City and Menlo Park would get the stop. But they're only so talking for about doing it, on train, it would be very valuable yeah, for them. That's right. And that isn't going to make or break. Their no, it, it it won't make or break it. Their ability to jam all those trains down the line is, is going to depend on other stations and other problems, not, not ours. But as Alex was but, saying... But they're going, to, they're going to squeeze the number of uh, trips to Atherton. They're going to try to make it as few and few as possible because there's going to be more ridership in Redwood City and there's going to be more ridership in Menlo Park. And, um, and so if, if we want more service, that just means that Redwood City and Menlo Park is going to lose out on a whole bunch of service and that's going to uh, not going to be amenable to Caltrain. Yeah. The trips in the 2040 business plan, every time they had a stop in Atherton, they removed a stop in Menlo Park and they removed or a stop in Redwood City. They're not adding stops. They're just taking away stops from the big neighboring right. stations right. and stopping here instead. And as Matt was saying, when you have these huge developments in Menlo Park, and in Redwood City, that's where the real demand is. We can never compete with that. No, we don't want to. Right, exactly. Okay, I, I, I think we've heard everyone's opinion around here. Let's, uh, let's see if we can do a, a little voting and, and begin to focus on, on what we want to send to council. Uh, we, we have now uh, four options that we're dealing with. Uh, the, the first one is to restore full, full, servi full service uh, to Atherton. The second one is to close the station. The third one is to move the station. And the fourth one is what uh, Malcolm suggested, main, keep the same service we have today, the weekend service, and don't press for uh, a weekday service. Can I just want to say one thing? I don't think, though, it's up to us to decide whether Caltrain can move that station. I, yeah, I was actually going to say, that's, I, I agree. I actually, that's beyond our scope. Yeah, I, I actually agree that it, it, if we did have any language in, that talked about moving, I would enclose it within the, the closure, that, that we would advocate for closure or move relocation of the I station. I think that has to because be something worked yeah. out. I think the objective of restoring full service is completely unrealistic. If full service means at least a train every half hour during the rush hours in the morning and the evening, that'll never happen. That's, that's asking too much. So I, I think that option should be eliminated. <coughs> I feel like I should represent Jim. I think he handed out that Caltrain used to actually have stops a lot more often than that. Like I'm yeah, still on board. Yeah, he passed out a yeah, schedule. Yeah, he passed out a schedule. Which is something like the service of Malcolm we are talking about. Yeah. Where is Jim? And it's, uh, the statement is aspirational anyway. It's so yeah. it's what we want. We may not get it, but it's, it's what we're pushing for. She's going back to New York, and he's getting ready to go back. I'm sorry. I couldn't hear what Alex said. Alex um, stated that um, it's an aspirational statement. We may not get that, but it's an ask to get us better service for the week. Well, no. Did you say that, Alex? No. Is that is that right, yeah, Alex? Yeah, that's what I said. I, I mean, I mean, to me, it seems like there's really just two choices, which is we want a lot of service, or we want closure. This halfway. I mean. No, no, none of us are advocating for like, let's go for, we only want weekend only service. It's, it's what well, we may get only weekend only service, but we want, you know, as much service as possible, or we want closure. I think that's the real two choices. We don't have any other uh, things that we want aspirationally. Well, we, we tied closure and relocating the station together. 
just just okay. a minute ago, and I think we ought to leave those so that uh, they're a joint option. And so we're, we're really okay. talking about the difference between providing service and uh, closing the station. That's that's what it has come down to. It depends on whether you mean some service or full service. No, we, we're not we're not discussing the service level. Well, that leaves it open for. Alex pointed out we can't control that. We would like as much service as we can get. So the the uh, retained service is to get as much as we can. So it really boils down to three choices. Stay the course, no service, or regular local service. Like it's not even stay the course. No, it's stay, stay the there, course, there's, there's two. close stay. It, it's either stay the course and get as much service as we can in the future, or close the station or relocate it. Oh. It's those two. Those are do, the we, do we know enough to say keep that relocation thing in there? What does that mean? Tear down what we got and put a tin put, shack up there? Where did the that come from? I've never heard of that. Well, <coughs> oh, there's a guy that goes around at all these meetings promoting it. I don't know his name. If, if, <laughs> if the station were moved up there, John, we could have a quiet zone throughout Atherton Why? and have reasonably close access to service. I, I understand that part. I'm saying then what does relocation entail physically? Are they? Well, uh, probably building a new station. So, so that would yeah. essentially close and, this one and, and we, make it available. We, we would either make this a, an historic landmark with the Civic Center or tear it down. Can, can we make the thing? After talking with, uh, after hearing the rest of this point of view, I, I, I still think that move is is is, is, uh, is an option, but it's an option that Caltrain has to decide. Right. So what what I think we should do, if, if we're going to put that on the table, um, is actually, but if, if we want the language to reflect the fact that we're not that, that if Caltrain sees a need to provide service between uh, Menlo Park and Redwood City, maybe the, the the wording should be that we that our that the towns policy in response to the business plan should be our, our request is to close it with a suggestion of providing better service um, in a higher density area. Like we don't have to be prescriptive and say please open up a station at, at Biff and and um, at the, at, at the fifth overpass. El Camino. Or, or, yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah, I, mean, I don't think it's in, I, we're in a position to be prescriptive no. about where they open up in the station. It's not really a part of our, our we have no role. business. We have, yeah. we have no control. But That's we can true. suggest it. Like, you know, there, there's a little bit of politics, I think, in what we're, and if we we've suggest another location for it, because the, I think that there is a, a need for the nearby communities to have a station for at least local service somewhere well, nearby. Well, we could bring in the uh, Dumbarton project. Right, yeah, that's, that. that's a good example. Yeah. And suggest that perhaps a station at, that, that would serve the trains coming across uh, and down the Dumbarton track mm -hmm. would be a better location than Atherton. Yeah, that, yes. Then we're not being prescriptive and saying we think you should do no, law. No, like that's just yeah, but to let them make the decision as to whether they need a some station well, representation. Yeah, between well, them. we don't. We won't know for a long time whether there's any rail service across Dumbarton at all. Yeah, but that is being studied, and it's a. It's not, a only, not only that, we don't know. It might, part of the plan was to simply to have it either Union City or Fremont on the other side and. Redwood City on this side, you wouldn't have gone. And then another plan was, well, let's have it alternating, partly going north and going south, yeah. but we don't know, and I think to bring that in is wrong, because you know, uh, nobody's been more on that than I have on Dumbarton, but uh, that's really not, uh, there's not gonna be service coming down uh, to us. Well, it, it won't, you know, it won't impact, uh, you know, there will be no service coming into Africa on that line. 
Well, but if we're saying, we don't even know where the Dumbarton line is going to be. It may end up in Redwood City. That was the original plan, actually. Well, it could, it could be anywhere, because yeah. they're not going to use the old structure. They'll have to build a new structure for whatever they do. Yeah. Or renovate. And new well, one, they would have to that, fire. That is, is beyond renovation, <laughs> Malcolm. <laughs> Does the alternative of moving the station include as subsets within Atherton or without it being within Atherton's borders? Or do we want to leave that open? Just move it somewhere? I think we want to leave it open. Um, might I give a little suggestion? You have two options, station, no station. If you choose the Atherton or no station, I think the rail community could be supportive of a another location with yeah. activity to the East Bay as an alternate to the closing of the Atherton station to increase yeah. transportation east and west along the pool. Mm. You know, transportation. Did you say that last sentence? It would be a goal because I think that most of the people here believe in the public transportation component. Yeah. And I think by planting the seed, if the station is closed, we would be supportive of a connectivity point along the corridor to an east and west direction similar to the Dunbar I think that would be a pretty good. Without being too specific. Without being yes. specific, but yeah. being open to being supportive yeah. of Caltrain discussing an option that we've heard about. Yeah. Yeah. Because we don't want to make any firm, you've got to do this or else. And they might like the fact that if you're giving up a stop, that you'd be supportive of another stop that could actually create more connectivity from this county to oh. Okay, are we? Uh, I just like to tell um, uh, I think we can expect if the full service were to be restored, which is unlikely, that the, the quality of that service would be in direct proportion, <coughs> the, the impacts of the quality of that service would be in direct proportion to the quality of that service, the frequency of the service. So we're not going to, we wouldn't be returning to 2005. It's a whole new world, a whole new rea reality now. There's more traffic, there's more congestion, there's Facebook. Yes. Um, so what, what, would it, what would the area around the new town center and the station look like if, there, if, you know, be careful what you wish for, if you actually got that full service again? And uh, Robert is, was pointed out some of the... Uh, uh, some of those those impacts in his uh, memo, mm -hmm. and I mean he was talking about shuttles, yes. and you talked about the parking structure. Right. So I just I, I think that those things should should be really kind of fully understood and faced as to what this whole area would look like. How many parking places would there be as it stands right now out there? Thirty. Thirty parking places. For, or for everybody, for the, for the oh, boys and that's well, you see, Sorry. that that's what they have in their right of way. Obviously, the that's all they have. Yeah, but the configuration of our civic center, share, just as it does now, share some of that parking. But that that's our civic center. Right? Yeah. So they have less than thirty. So it's less than thirty. Obviously, it's meters. If you bring up the uh, the Caltrain station for Atherton, here's what it says: ninety-six parking spaces. 26 bicycle spaces, it outlines it. Now, obviously, things have changed when we're putting the Civic Center. I'm a big supporter of the Civic Center, but we're making a huge mistake taking some of that parking if we're gonna have service. I think that's a serious mistake. And I do think that uh, if we're gonna make a major change in what we're doing here, we really should be going to the community with a survey to find out what the community feels. I think that is important. We've done that in major uh, cases in the past. I think we, the town should know that. It is a democracy, and it ought to be what people uh, really favor. Well, one thing we've been asked at the January 9th meeting for the rail committee to vote, the people here, and that goes to the city council for them to make a decision on February right. 20th. We right. can't make that decision. No, we're not making a decision. All we can ever do is recommend. Exactly. That's, that's our role entirely. I think we got to recognize that weekday service serves a different market than weekend service. Weekday service serves people commuting to and from work. 
and if you're commuting to and from work, you want to have the schedule offer you the alternative of missing a train and catching another one real soon. That's right. And that means... More stops. More stops. Yeah. And uh, going back to the way it was in 2005. Yeah. I don't think there's anything in between. Well, for a time, when I lived at Maple Avenue, I rode the train, it was very dependable, and I got there to work and got back home. But we should be able to do the same. It was good service. If it's good, well, it, it could be it could be restored. That's that's a possibility. Not likely, but it's not likely. I would hate to see us putting restrictions on something yeah. that is a valuable service. So we're we're voting really on two things here: whether to uh, recommend that the council that they uh, close the station, or whether we. Uh, recommend to the council that they keep the station open and take advantage of whatever service opportunities there are. Nothing about SB 50? Nothing about no, SB 50. Good. Is, that, is that clear? That's right. yes. The second one again, does that, that includes both the quest for full service and the keep it as it is options? Uh, yes. That so includes both of those. Need? Well, because oh. as it is, is we can service. Okay. So we retain service and uh, keep the station open. And that that's that recommendation. And we'll, we'll negotiate with them for as much service as we can get. But the policy is to keep the service and continue to have an African station. And the other option is to close the station to provide for a uh, quiet zone throughout Atherton, tie the uh, uh, present quiet zone down to Watkins. Okay, how many votes do we have to keep keep the service? Four. And how many votes to uh, close? Three. Three. Aye. There's not enough votes. Well, have I? Have you voted? Have you voted? What is the vote? I thought there's nine of us. There are. Did you come? It should be a five four decision. Okay. Which, which direction have you voted? I want to wait and see. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't have that privilege. <laughs> then I will stay. Okay, that leaves you, Paul. Well, that, that leaves uh, four. All right, how many people in favor of closing the station? We have, Aye. We have so three. there's three, and then there's you. That has well, it, it's yeah. four three without me. Aye. Can you hear? Is it yeah, we have, we have you, Alex. Oh, okay. Um, just for okay. your, okay. just sure. so that you understand where we are, uh, Narissa and Scott voted along with you for closure. Um, okay. We have uh, Jack, Malcolm, John and Tony that have voted for uh, retention and full service or as much service as we can get. And we have a re... Uh, what, are you, what are you doing? Huh? You want me to vote? He's Why just watching me. He can't vote. No, he can't vote. Um, and yeah. then Greg has abstained and we haven't heard from Paul yet. Uh, I, I'm okay. not going to vote because if I... I'll, I'll either tie it up or I'll push it over onto the whole service. And I, I, I declined to vote. So that's two abstentions. I can't hear what you're saying, Paul. I abstain. So what's the vote? The vote is to keep the service. Four, four to three. three. Four, four to three. three. Well, if I voted the other way, it'd be four to four. Then I'd have to break the tie. You want to put that on my shoulders? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. That, uh, that is our decision. We'll pass that on to the council. Okay. I want to thank you folks for coming and expressing yourselves. Thank you for hearing us out. You know, it wasn't a separate item today for SB. No, there was 50. not, because that's but not our business. But I think the council, rather than the committee, 
it, should consider addressing SB 50 it, and taking a stand on it because it has some pretty significant implications. It's uh, state rights versus city rights, and that's important. Well, they agree. State rights versus city rights. It's a key thing, right Taking out a local control and doing it. Yeah. Safe. But we're not talking about that. Okay. Well, it was four to three <laughs> favoring paper. Yes, favor maintaining service. Jim would have been here. Well, but although we could steer back to the language that they current that the town currently has on policy, that we just voted on keeping uh, recommending keeping the station there. Yes. But, but what we did not vote on is to whether we are advocating for full service or well, we're we're advocating for full service, and we'll take what we can get. Okay. Okay, we have about a dozen things on our agenda that we have, I know. We have not touched. Plow through this. If there's a desire to push some of these off, we can certainly uh, do that. If we want to go out of order, I, I can tell you that the Dumbarton Trail is actually surprisingly short. Do you think it would be? Okay. Uh, I, I, yeah, I'll, I'll just take care of it. So uh, I just did research in my last uh, report. Um, the, there was a... Uh, um, the Facebook, Sam Trans, and the Plenary Group um, are together to um, do some pre preliminary work on restoring service uh, on the Dumbart Dumbarton Rail Line. Mm -hmm. They're supposed to be starting this quarter um, uh, for um, community outreach, um, but I, I've been combing through their minutes on the Sam Trans site, and so far they, they've had some meetings discussing it, but the, so far they're no imminent plans for community outreach. And as soon as, as, soon as they provide any information uh, as to when they're going to start doing that, I'll update the group for you. But so right now there's no... This is a long future thing. Yeah. Let's not hold our breath. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, the Caltrain update, there's not really much to say. They continue to work. Uh, <coughs> They have not yet solved the constant warning time system, but they think they know how to do it. Uh, they have asked for a four-month extension on the uh, inspection and test of their positive train control system, though all the equipment has been installed. And they're continuing to run their own tests. And other than that, they, they've installed, uh, 51 foundations have been poured, and so on and so forth. Yeah, I have one item to add. Um, we just got contacted today by uh, Balfour Beattie about their continuation of work in Atherton. And so um, they haven't formally submitted their exemption request for work hours, but it's anticipated that Thursday night, the 14th, um, overnight they'll be closing the Fair Oaks Crossing similar to how they closed Watkins. There'll be message boards and everything yes. up. Um, hopefully w our requirement is a week in advance. There'll be notifications out to the residents, but just for your information that they plan to do work uh, in and around the Fair Oaks Crossing um, on the night of the 14th outside of the revenue service hours. Okay. No, will that be pole installation? Foundations. Still yeah, so they closed the Watkins Avenue crossing, I think, in December, and they were working to get foundations up in that area. Now they're going to be working at Fair Oaks. Have they put any poles in? No, 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 not yet. They've only put 51 poles in system wide. So that's, <laughs> that's going very slowly. They've got, I don't know, something like 300 poles. Or Actually, uh, high speed rail may come first. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, may I ask you something? Uh, just for a moment before we skip topics. Do you remember at the joint meeting, the January 9th meeting, Vice Mayor DeGaulle requested that we look at one other modification to the rail policy? Do you remember it was about the Watkins uh, crossing? May I, uh, and there was a handout. Do you remember that? He made 
the appeal at the end about some wording yes. on Watkins. Yes. And there was a handout which Robert provided. May I just read that so when we voted well, on this? Yeah, we, we would like to pass that on to them as well. Right. May I just yeah, read go what ahead he and says? Read okay. Because this is a change in the wording regarding Watkins. So um, this is what uh, Vice Mayor de Gaulle handed out at the meeting. I just wanted to read it because he had made that plea at the end. So here's what he wrote. Caltrain must take all necessary steps to make rail transit through the rail corridor as safe as possible, including the maintenance of quad gates at Farrell's Lane and the establishment of quad gates at the Watkins Avenue crossing. And he did that to change the wording yeah. regarding Watkins. And it's on here, and I just wondered if okay. we could vote on that because he said it was very right. important for uh, the future. Do, do we approve of that wording? Now, where is that got wording going? It's, it's part it, of our recommendation. It's the wording on the real policy break that uh, was originally given to us. Um, it's a modification it's a of what modification we, what we uh, sent in last time. Right. And we did again. This is Vice Mayor DeGolden's wording. Caltrain must take all necessary steps to make rail transit through the rail corridor as safe as possible, including the maintenance of quad gates at Fair Oaks Lane and the establishment of quad gates at the Watkins Avenue crossing. Those, those were the words that And where would that go? It's just a modification of the existing wording regarding a Watkins. He wanted Is to that a letter we sent in or draft? No, when, you, when the Real committee order. voted before, the language was town seeks to add the Watkins Avenue crossing to the quiet zone within the town through the addition of quad gates at the Watkins Avenue crossing. And the, so that, he that had was the previous this language. specific wording be put in. He changed the wording because if, if we keep the station open, they will still be blowing horns in the station. But he did he, he change the emphasis from, the from emphasis. noise to safety. Yeah. From what you just read, he doesn't mention noise at all. Right, it's regarding right. Watkins. Yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's not the Watkins. platform, it's just regarding it's the Watkins. A good, I think it's a good change. It's, it's regarding yeah. the safety yeah. issue. Yeah, yes. I, I, I is, agree. is that agreeable to everyone? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, let's, let's put that in. Uh, the litigation, the uh, appeal process is underway, and the uh, council are, are uh, lining up the supporters for the appeal. Uh, do you know, uh, Carrie, whether Arthur is going to take <coughs> a position on that yet? No, I can tell you that we'll, we will wait for feedback from other parties in the uh, Okay. So that's that's still underway. That it, and so the the appeal will not be filed until that work is complete. Okay, we've got them. Okay. There was one yeah. other change on here in red. Um, Vice Mayor DeGolia had made this change also to the wording of the real policy, which we were given. We never came up. It's not as if our committee came up yeah. with it. So I'm just uh, looking at this. And looking at his changes, may I just read this? Caltrain must continue to enforce the compliance requirements for the Fair Oaks Lane Quiet Zone. I think everybody would agree with that. Yeah. So is that, is that going to be included then with those priorities in our policy? Yes. And we, if you all agree, then we can yes. add that yes. in. Yes, yes, that will go in there. Yes, okay. Take yeah. a straw poll. I saw a nodding hand, so I haven't I heard anybody opposed. I no, yeah. I I, anybody opposed? Oh, the, the, the next item is the... Uh, that would be the, no. No. Okay. <laughs> the draft of the letter to be sent to uh, uh, Hartnett about the, uh, the problems that been occurring in Denver. Did you want to update from Nurse first on Denver or not? Yeah. Okay. Um, um, I've tried to make it's a very become a very complex
complex and far too many issue. So I've tried to simplify it here. If you have any questions, feel free to ask me. Or, and if it's too complicated, we can certainly t I can certainly answer anything uh, after the meeting if you would like. I've tried to simplify it. Okay. Uh, so in April, it will be three years since Denver's electrified commuter rail transit first went operational with Denver's A line. As the FRA reported last November, the grade crossing safety gates and the grade crossing warning devices are still not operating in accordance with the contractor's Denver Transit Partners own design, even with the additional 20 second buffer, which was granted to Denver's A line under a five year waiver by the FRA and the Colorado PUC. The G line remains closed due to the fact that it uses the same warning system for grade crossing warning. The design, build, operate, and maintain contractor Denver Transit Partners is now suing the Regional Transportation District of Denver for $80 million for reimbursement of the cost of the human flaggers and for payments withheld by the RTD as a penalty for Denver Transit Partners not meeting performance standards. In response to the FRA's November 15th letter to the RTD and Denver Transit Partners, in which the FRA threatened a potential shutdown of the A-line because of its malfunctioning grade crossing warning system, Colorado's two U.S. Senators and two of its seven members from the House of Representatives met with the RTD, Denver Transit Partners, and the FRA to try to avoid a shutdown. The RTD and Denver Transit Partners did comply with the FRA's request by submitting a 35-page remedial action plan by the December deadline. Whereas Denver Transit Partners had said in November to various news organizations that the system was working exactly as it had been designed, the action plan does outline system malfunctions and issues ongoing for the last three years and commits to fix the problems by the end of 2020. The plan concludes with a statement describing the fundamental problem issues. Quote, the RTD commuter line crossings are complex and present unique challenges associated with station stops, short distances between crossings, and operational factors, unquote. So those are the three issues that it, that it that it highlights. Station stops, short distances between crossings, additional factors. The text summarizes that stations which are in close proximity to rail grade crossings have caused the extended gate downtimes and the unpredictability of the length of the gate downtimes. That would be something that would be relevant potentially to any situation where you have a station very close to a rail grade crossing. Also, without any real explanation, the plan says the other main recalcitrant problem is road rail grade crossings, which are located closely together. They are the other cause of the same gate problems. The plan also mentions loss of the GPS signal due to blockage from high-rise buildings. That's the operational issue, but says that signal repeaters are likely to provide a solution. Analysis through investigative process and the development of a software tool to analyze grade crossing warning times, which are outside the bounds of the 20-second added buffer, is essentially the action plan. I just want to make a comment here I, should, I wanted to note that there has been some assertions that the insistence on meeting uh, the Denver warning time, including the FRA's additional 20-second buffer, is a bureaucratic imposition by the FRA. I would say that that is not supported by the facts. The grade, the gate downtime, and the um, assurance that Denver could meet this uh, advance warning time and the 20-second buffer was purely a function that Denver designed this system themselves. They came up with the warning times. 
They requested of the FRA and the PUC this additional 20-second buffer, and they were granted both of those. They were granted the agreement to their own design, and they were granted the 20-second buffer. Uh, as far as bureaucratic imposition, I would say that is completely false because you can see here I have a letter dated September 8, 2017 on Denver Regional Transportation District stationery requesting the addition of a 20-second buffer saying we can meet the standards of our own design if you grant us the FRA 20-second buffer. Keep in mind, that the minimum warning time is only 20 seconds. So an additional 20 second buffer is a big deal. You can't say that the Federal Railroad Administration acted bureaucratically because 20 days later, on September 28th, the FRA said, fine, you have the 20 second buffer. Uh -huh. Minus five seconds or an additional 15 seconds beyond your design standard that you requested. So I think it is, in, it is inaccurate to say that the FRA in this instance was bureaucratic in any way. And the 36-page the, uh, response that the Denver Transit Partners sent was largely just a justification of their own actions. It, uh, it didn't recognize any wrongdoing in any way are still good and silvery, shiny, bright, competent, and all those other good words. <laughs> but I the facts don't seem to support that. I did want to mention one other point, and that is when you read this detail, what comes out here is something important that's only, as far as I am aware, mentioned twice before. And that is that Zorail slash Wattec is the sub-subcontractor who developed the grade crossing warning system in Denver. That is under the auspices of Denver Transit Partners and Alpha B. It is the sub-subcontractor, Zorail Wabtec. And Wabtec is the firm that is doing Caltrain's positive train control. Positive train control. Now, one thing I learned in here is that the Denver system is a combination it appears to be somewhat of a off-the-shelf, if you will, that may be a stretch, but it is the incorporation of a positive train control system from Wattec, and it incorporates a wireless crossing system. And that wireless crossing system then would not be hardwired, it's using radio control, and it's involving the GPS system to locate uh, trains, to uh, calculate their speed, and to predict the amount of time it will take for that train to reach the upcoming crossing. It uses <coughs> components in addition to that, grade crossing warning devices, et cetera, from GE, from Alstrom, and other vendors. So it is not a completely custom system built from the ground up, and it is not completely um, <coughs> You know, it's under the auspices, if you will, of Denver Transit Partners of Balfour B. It is a sub subcontractor. And I wanted to mention that. That's all I know. All right. I, I would uh, recommend that we, uh, we strongly endorse the, the draft letter that, that has been written to Caltrain, apprising them of difficulties in Denver. It does not go into any of the detail that there is a described there, but I think the wording is uh, is appropriate for uh, a transmission from a mayor to a chief executive. Carrie, I wanted to ask you. And mail. you were all sent copies of that. <coughs> and it's in the packet. And I I uh, request a, a vote on whether we should encourage that letter to go. Could I just ask for Carrie as a liaison to City Council? How do you feel about it? Um, giving that notification of basic care in the area. Yes. Well, do they know? Or are they hiding from it? I think it sends a signal that uh, towns are paying attention. Yeah. So we know. We know. Yeah. They know. We know. Now, they, 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 
This basically takes away the deniability. Yeah. yeah. And, and with the, that knowledge, maybe they want to do something about it because they know they can't deny it. And I would say that it also creates a record. Yes. That we know, that they should know this already. So, uh, could we have a motion to that effect? Could we so moved. Second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. I'm opposed. You're opposed. Yes. Do you I, think it ought to be a tougher letter? No. I I would say the following. I've given it a great deal of thought. Clearly, the JPB knows about this. I know that it was mentioned at the last GK, JPB meeting to them. Um, they, they know all about this. And I feel that because they already know about it, I feel that they would just feel offended, if you will, that uh, who is the town to be telling them um, about their business? And, um, well, we're, we're not telling them. It's just raising a, a, an issue that we think they ought to be aware of. We're not telling them what to do. And I would also add that the town has, uh, has historically, every town, should have feel an obligation to represent the best interests of the citizens of the community and long down times effects have a negative potential uh, uh, quality of life as well as safety considerations and i think it's in within the town's purview to kind of say hey we have concerns about this particular technology and its impact on the community and i think you're also saying we don't want these problems so yeah. be aware of it these things are occurring or have occurred. So, so, so watch out. Don't so let it don't happen see, here. Don't sign off and say you're done. Oh, yeah. I think that I think that makes sense. Um, okay. Well, we've had the vote. And we're, we're is there anybody else that that letter should be sent to that maybe doesn't know this already? Well. Who, who's going to do anything about it? Well, I don't know. Who? Uh, Jerry Hill. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you, you two would know this better. Have any other towns expressed concerns about the gate downtown? That's shocking to me. That's amazing. They're, they're having a PPB meeting on uh, Thursday morning, if you'd like to come, Scott. They're, they're <laughs> very excited. Sorry, I'm not coming in today. I got to go to the JPD meeting. <laughs> it's a serious issue that is happening in our trash. Okay, we've done everything now except for the Menlo Park grave separation update. And uh, that's, that's very interesting. I attended a meeting on the 31st of uh, January with the uh, subcommittee on rail for Menlo Park. And the council prior to that meeting had uh, accepted alternative C of their grade separation projects, which included Ravenswood, Oak Grove, and Glenwood uh, under crossing a raised Caltrain track on a berm uh, for those three stations. Uh, there were many citizens there at the meeting and they all had objections to make about everything included in the program. They resurrected option A, which was solely for Ravenswood, and not for the other two streets. Uh, they uh, dredged out the trench and the tunnel, and by the time the uh, meeting was coming to a close, uh, all issues were back on the table. The, uh, There's also a viaduct, too. Sir? There was, oh, there was also a viaduct proposal as well. Yes, there was a, a viaduct, viaduct proposal as well, that's right, which would be a, an elevated train line with uh, a park under the viaduct. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought I brought the presentation, but I guess I didn't. And Palo Alto was talking. They're using the same consultant. Mm -hmm. 
they're getting the same input. Uh, and the uh, the chairman, who's the, who's the mayor, Ray Mueller, said at the end, we need to pick, get a, a list of criteria of things we want here and, and look at all the different areas because some people are blocked off uh, uh, the blockage of uh, access to Alma is a critical issue for some people. There are other people that are concerned about uh, cross street traffic at various places and the uh, he would like to do this in an orderly fashion that would allow them to come to some sort of a consensus. So the idea you can't please them all which as they stood there, they couldn't please any of them. <laughs> but that is still very much up in the air, and the Palo Alto is about the same. But they're going for a burn, are they? Yeah. Where's Redwood City on all that? I have no idea. Okay. I thought it was raised the drive. Red, Redwood City is studying, um, I, I don't know if. And the uh, Redwood City is studying uh, doing great separation on all their uh, streets, uh, but the one they're most focused on is their northernmost. Um, Whipple. 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 Yeah. And is that an elevated? I don't know what they're looking uh, at. I so. Yeah, I don't know. I think they're doing the study now, uh, and then that will come the recommendation. But I don't think they're opposed to doing something like uh, an elevated. I don't think it's not near. Well, it, there is some residential there, but it's you know near downtown, and I don't think uh, there's that much as much opposition. Although some businesses will object, but not not sure if there's any anything else they could do except elevate it um, and and get without going over the one percent grade change from one area to another, or being extrem enormously expensive. Um, since they reopened their their goal uh, of what type of grade separation, uh, have they submitted a request for funding from the San Mateo County Transit Authority? I don't know whether that request has gone in or not, Scott. Okay. Cause that won't be a problem. It won't? No. You know, they didn't even use all the funds he put in there for the... Nobody really wanted it early. That, that's not a... Really? Okay. Because yeah. I, I, I thought that there was um, other towns like uh, San Mateo and Burlingame that yeah, were change, but priorities were the, the California Public Utility Commission had their priorities, and we went along with that. But uh, it seems to me it's pretty clear that if if our neighbors in Menlo and Redwood City are going for an elevated one, we'll have no choice. They're not going to go down like that. So that, to me, is the big thing that we face in terms of impact for us. All the larger juris jurisdictions are going for them. Are they? they have, yeah, absolutely. Because they all have some have more than a singular intersection. So yeah. they're just trying to get in a queue because it's going to be based on yeah. when, you, when you ask for it. If you don't ask, you don't get it. You're not even on the list. So yeah, I think it's, it, even Menlo Park thinks it's going to take at least a decade, but probably earliest 15 years, whenever they decide that something will, will actually be constructed. So it's going to take a long time. Um, and, and in my personal opinion, if they're going to ask for three great separations, they'll probably never get the money uh, because the main focus now is funding the most dangerous intersect, uh, most dangerous crossings. And the most dangerous ones they, they have, which is Ravenswood, uh, you know, there's high interest in funding that, but not the uh, other two, Oak Grove and, and I forget the other street, but not, not the other two. So it's kind of like, well, you know, they want to do all three, but, you know, you know, it's going to increase the cost tremendously. Someone else has to pick up the funding, not the state, not the federal government, because they don't deem it as, as those two as dangerous compared to Ravenswood. You can't, like, ask for a whole bunch of other things just to fix one problem. Well, the, uh, the Ravenswood only was a thing that was adopted by the Mental Park Council. Yes. And then uh, more may or may not have been overturned by this subsequent meeting. Well, 
Okay. Yeah, I've I, got a couple I think comments that I they, can make. They, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I want oh, to read oh, from this uh, morning's I, paper. I, I think what they want, uh, me or, or, well, or, 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 or uh, Greg. Well, Greg, why don't you go ahead? All right, there was a couple of comments made last night at the City Council in Palo Alto. I'll just read them to you. The first one is uh, one of the council members said, in many cases, uh, the, the ass need to be put in the right context and need to be ready to, quite frankly, be prepared, not, a, not only alone via the city of Palo Alto, but in coordination and ideally in partnership with other cities and partners. The city manager said, we really can't go it alone. And then at the, the consultant, the, the lobbyist said he recommended asking for funds alone alongside asking for funds alongside neighboring cities and said that regionalization in general was a more powerful way to make changes as opposed to be being on an island by yourself and so he's suggesting that the cities get together to ask for funding rather than trying to get it alone and i think us being the smallest city this is an invitation for us to get together with palo alto and menlo to get something done that we could never do alone. So I, I, I just... Now one of the problems there is they're different counties and so yeah. their funding is different from ours. They go to their own... Yeah. Well, no, but you go to the, the state. I don't think the county makes any difference. Okay, but if you're... Okay, it depends on the source of funds you're after. But if you're going after your county funds like we do here with the TA, Santa Clara has their own. Well, no, but they're getting state funding so it would bypass. Okay, well that's fine then, yeah. And I, and I, I think the guy is, you know, he's a lobbyist that does this full time. And he's saying it's much easier, not easier, but more likely that we would get something if we went in as a, a group of cities rather than in each one of us trying to go in and alone. So I, I just want to get that it's state it, it, Both state and local. Say again? State and local funding. So there's, it's like any type of grant or possibility. You reach for everything. And I think that that's what they're doing. They're going to try to get money to the state. They will definitely not bypass the sales tax revenue source component that they pass. So they're in the queue. They want to be in the queue in all directions. And with Menlo Park, if we're talking about Oak Grove and Ensenal. No, they're not talking about Ensenal. Oh, they're not. Okay, but Oak Grove. Oak Grove and Glenwood. Yeah. Okay, well, Glenwood is certainly part of a Safton and part of Oak Grove is Safton. Oh, yes. So, I mean, in a way, that's another case we should definitely be working on those together because it's going to impact us as it is with Menlo Park. When I use Caltrain, I, I use the Menlo Park Station. Mm -hmm. It's uh, six tenths of a mile from where I live. It's a short walk. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing I learned last night is somebody's recommending they shut down one of the Palo Alto intersections, but I I don't Churchill. know which Churchill. one it was. Churchill. Churchill. Was it Churchill? Yeah. Churchill. Churchill. Who was recommending it? I didn't. I just heard the same thing. I Churchill. talked to the mayor and the city manager alone after the meeting because we were the only three left in the room. So uh, <laughs> it was 11.30. Uh, and, you know, I do want to say why I abstained. And the reason I abstained is I plan on selling my house. And I just think it would look like a conflict if I voted either way. Where are you going to move? Probably up to Sharon Heights. Well, yeah. But we'll see. So I, I want to stay. If I can figure out a way to stay, I will. So what's the uh, Afternoon and Rail Committee going to do without Greg Conlon? Well, I'll sit in the lot and I'll sit in the <laughs> bleachers and make uh, comments appropriately. Like I do with the city council meetings. I'm the last we, speaker we expect, every meeting. We expect it. <laughs> they don't close without me nope. showing up. So. Okay, I think we've done all the damage we can do for one evening. <laughs> do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Thank you very much. Aye. Thank you. I'm sorry it went on so long, but it was a subject. <laughs>